the cloud. Okay. And um, and Pandy, I'm just going to let you take it away. Okay. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, what is the email address that we should send our message to? WPNC. I'm going to type it in real quick. WPNC at Nashville.gov or Rachel Koch at Nashville.gov. And just say that um, <clears throat> that you watch the, the uh, webinar on amphibians and here's your email address so that we can then have it to send you the link. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, yeah, I am Pandy of Church and we do have a full hour here. So we're going to be ripping through this. Um, I wouldn't even try to take notes. Just look at that recording uh, later on. Um, but I am going to share with you my love of amphibians and reptiles um, in Tennessee. And I think the most important thing that uh, you're going to get out of this is that, um, you know, um, we have a great diversity of amphibians and reptiles in, in our state. So, uh, you know, the question that most folks have is what is the difference between an amphibian and a reptile? Uh, we're going to cover them both tonight. Um, amphibians typically have smooth skin. Uh, they have gelatinous eggs and on their toes, when they do have toes, some amphibians don't, uh, they have claws on their toes, on, on their feet. Now, basically, amphibians are tied to the water. I mean, they've got to stay moist or they're going to dry out. Reptiles, on the other hand, they have made evolutionary advances that allow them to leave the water and have a more terrestrial lifestyle. Uh, so their body is covered in scales and that helps them to retain their moisture. Uh, they have eggs that are uh, leathery and sometimes even hard, you know, like some turtle eggs are hard like a ping pong ball. Uh, and they have claws uh, on their toes, on their feet. And so uh, that helps them to climb. Both of them are ectothermic, uh, which, you know, people used to say cold blooded. Uh, but we've learned that a lot of ectotherms like to be really hot. So cold blooded isn't really a correct term uh, anymore. So, but ectothermic means that they are the same temperature as whatever the air or water or whatever medium they're in uh, is around them. They're vertebrates, so they've got backbones. So I'm going to go through the different um, class, you know, amphibian and the different orders of amphibians and reptiles uh, in our state. Uh, and a lot of folks don't know, but uh, Tennessee is the salamander capital of the world, and that is not an exaggeration, and, and that's mostly because of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, you know, during uh, the ice, you know, the, the glacial uh, advances to the south, um, they, the glaciers stopped right at the Smoky Mountains, and so that pushed a lot of uh, amphibians into the nooks and crannies of the Smoky Mountains for long enough periods of time that they were able to speciate, and so a, a lot of especially plethodontid uh, salamanders, you know, got their start in the Great Smoky Mountains. So we have over 54 species, or we have 54 species of salamanders uh, in Tennessee. So that is a great diversity, and people come from all over the world uh, to see our salamanders. Um, and so let's go through them. I mean, we've got some giant salamanders. One of the coolest sal salamanders that we have are our eastern hellbenders, and they're considered to be giant salamanders. That's because they are uh, so large. Um, these guys have those lasagna uh, rolls on their sides and, and they are very large uh, aquatic uh, salamanders. They're state endangered uh, and they were studied for a while by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service whether or not they should be federally endangered, but they determined that our uh, species of hellbender is, is okay enough not to be listed as federally endangered. Um, but they do uh, have issues, and, and it's mostly due to water quality. Uh, they need fast-flowing, highly oxygenated streams. Um, and whenever sedimentation gets in there and uh, in, embeds uh, the areas where they, they reproduce and, and live, they can't live there anymore. So sedimentation is a, a major conservation issue uh, for, for eastern uh, hellbenders. Another issue is habitat. Uh, destruction on a, on a small scale. I mean, uh, for whatever reason, 
uh, people when they go to the mountains, which is you know one of the places the hellbenders occur, is like the Little River uh, in Townsend is a great place to see hellbenders. Uh, in Middle Tennessee, places like Big Swan Creek is a good place to see hellbenders. And the Little Buffalo, you can see hellbenders there still. Uh, but people want to stack these flat rocks. Uh, and unfortunately, these flat rocks are hellbender habitat. And so this is where they breed. This is where they hide. And when people move these rocks like this, they're actually removing hellbender habitat. So we ask folks to please don't stack the rocks, however uh, zen it, it may be at the time. Uh, it's not healthy for the, the hellbenders. So moving on to one of our other larger uh, salamanders, and that's the mud puppy. This is another aquatic uh, salamander. So uh, not all amphibians, you know, uh, go out on land and then come back to breed and, and have that dual lifestyle. A lot of uh, the salamanders, such as the hellbender and the mud puppy, are, are truly aquatic and spend their entire life uh, in the water. Mud puppies uh, have these plumes of gills on the side of their head, so you can see that they require highly oxygenated streams as well, although sometimes you can find them in ponds. Uh, those plumes are just going to look different uh, when they're in a pond. They have four toes on each foot. So most of the time when I'm talking salamanders, uh, amphibians, uh, and reptiles too, you've got four toes on the front and five toes on the back. But for uh, mud puppies, they've got four toes on the front and four toes on the back. Now, why is this important for you in Middle Tennessee? That is because if you are looking uh, in a pond and you find a very large uh, amphibian like this, it could be a mud puppy or it could be a tiger salamander larvae. And so uh, the way that you're going to tell those two apart uh, is that a tiger salamander larvae is going to have five toes on their back feet, whereas the mud puppy has four on the front and four on the back. Uh, mud puppies are neotenic, and what that means is that they never fully mature. Um, so they're going to actually breed and go through all of their life stages uh, in the larval stage. So they're, they're never, ever going to develop into the, the full-grown um, mud puppy, um, but they're going to stay in that neotenic stage. These guys are large, 8 to 13 inches total length. Now, I'm going to talk to you about different uh, sizes of amphibians and reptiles, and when you're reading literature and things of that sort, you need to keep in mind, what are they actually measuring? What, what is the size? Total length is from the nose all the way to the tip of the tail. That's a total length. And that's what we refer to when we're, when we're looking at the, the length of a salamander. Uh, but these mud puppies, they occur in permanent bodies of water, uh, but a pond in Middle Tennessee would do. And here's that tiger salamander that you might confuse um, a, a mud puppy with the larval stage of the tiger salamander. Um, this is a super cool uh, salamander in the genus Ambystema. These are the mole salamanders, the salamanders that are fossorial. Uh, that live their life underground until they become ready to breed and then they they come up out of, from underneath the ground and they go to a body of water and and they breed they do this in the winter so these guys are winter breeders one of the things that you're going to notice is that there is no pattern for amphibians and reptiles everybody every species does their own thing at different times of the year in different ways so uh, we've got incredible diversity as far as the number of species these, but also incredible number of diversity in the way these animals live. So it, they're fascinating and you can never learn everything there is to know about amphibians and reptiles. Uh, but these guys are winter breeders. They breed in January. So as soon as it warms up in January to 50 degrees and starts raining, these guys are moving toward the breeding pools. Uh, and it can be ephemeral pools, uh, but it can be a farm pond as well. Uh, one place that I know that they occur is at Owls Hill in their ponds, if you're familiar uh, with, with that area. Um, another place that they've been found is uh, at the Warner Park Nature Center uh, grounds. Deb Beasley, uh, back in the late 80s, dug one of these up in the organic garden with her tillers, you know, and, and uh, so it was still in the fossorial stage. Uh, so these guys are underneath the ground until they're ready to breed. Uh, come out their big seven to eight and a quarter inches uh, in length. Again, that's total length out to the end of the tail. There is a species of greatest conservation need, and that just means we want to learn more about them. They're not listed as, as uh, you know, deemed in need of management or uh, yet, but, but we, we just need more information about these incredible um, burrowing salamanders that, that come out um, to, to breed in January. 
and like I said, here's here's an ambestima uh, in the gene, ambestima opacum, the marble salamander, the sky breeds in the fall. Uh, so these guys have an entirely different life strategy uh, than those tiger salamanders. The marble salamanders, they are going to go to the breeding pool in the fall. Before it rains, they're going to uh, lay their eggs in ephemeral pools, which are temporary pools when they're still dry. And, and the mother or the female uh, marbled salamander will stay with those eggs, you know, and, until it rains, until they develop and turn into larvae that, that can swim. So, uh, the, again, another incredible uh, life uh, cycle. Uh, these guys, are, typically it's the third week in September. Now, you know, the reason I know that is because it, it happens a lot of times during the TEEA conference when they used to have it. Uh, the third week in, in September. So you'll uh, start marking your calendar for, with some of these events uh, as time goes on. But these guys are three and a half to four and a half inches uh, in length, total length. Fall breeder. Here's another winter breeder, the streamside salamander. Uh, and this is a state endangered species. Uh, this guy is, is uh, threatened due to habitat loss due to development. This is an endemic which means it occurs no place else in the world except for the interior low plateau in Tennessee and Kentucky uh, and, and a, a couple of states north of their Ohio. But uh, these guys breed in the winter. They breed in streams, first order streams. And what that means is you've got your headwaters and the very next stage of the stream is your first order stream. So very young streams, very small streams. So, uh, uh, you know, here we go, threatened by a uh, lack of habitat, habitat development, and inaccurate stream determinations. In the state of Tennessee, um, streams get protected, and they have rules and, and um, things that protect the, the things that live, the aquatic life that live in the streams. Things called a wet weather conveyance do not get protected, and those are things that just have water flowing through them or water flowing over them. And streamside salamanders have a habitat of wanting to uh, breed in cedar glades. And if somebody goes out and does a stream determination, and this uh, the, the people I'm talking about is like the, the TDEC folks, the regulators that are deciding whether or not this body of water is going to get protection. When they go out and they look at a stream in a cedar glade in July, they're going to see a rock. And so they're not going to necessarily see uh, a stream, but these streamside salamanders may uh, lay their eggs there in the winter when there is water flowing. So uh, that's one of the issues that these guys have. They're, they're, they live in Nolansville, Lebanon. <laughs> so when you think of Nolansville and Lebanon, uh, they are losing uh, habitat at a, at a rapid rate. They're not huge. They're four to five and a half inches. Um, uh, again, total, total length. The super cool um, salamander, the streamside salamander. Here's one that it's a common salamander that most people are familiar with, uh, but they don't know how cool it is. This guy is the Eastern Red Spotted uh, Newt. Uh, again, it's two and a quarter to five inches long. It has the reverse life cycle, nothing like any of them. It starts out in the water, develops, turns into a phase called an eft, and then it leaves the water, and then it goes out onto land, and it can stay out on land for years. And then it grows up and then it comes back to the water and then it breeds and then it stays it stays in the water after that but it, it's its life cycle is reversed it's water to land back to back to water again but these guys are are super cool in that uh they have incredible courtship dances this is called the Liebespiel. so when we get to the frogs you'll see that frogs you know have a voice and that they can sing uh, but the salamanders do not have a voice. And so what they have to do is dance. And so um, the courtship, the leapishpill, is all about the male laying a, a spermatophore. And what it is trying to do is to get the female to take the spermatophore up via her cloaca uh, and fertilize her eggs with that particular salamander spermatophore. So it's all a, a dance of him straddling her. Um, head in this particular instance and, and wafting his tail back and forth, um, wafting smells to her and trying to encourage her to um, pick up that spermatophore that looks like a little pyramid. And this may be it in the picture. I'm not, I'm not sure, but they look like a little firm packet uh, in the shape of a pyramid. This is one of the most common salamanders uh, 
in Tennessee and one of the most common salamanders you would find at places like the Warner Parks. So this is a northern dusky salamander, Desmognathus fuscus. Um, and all of the salamanders in the genus Desmognathus uh, have this light stripe going from their eye across their, their cheek. They're large. They've got large uh, cheeks and that Desmognathus means, uh, you know, uh, a ligament jaw. They've got a really uh, big jaw there. Um, and these are what folks call um, spring lizards. So if you talk to a fisherman and say, what kind of bait are you using? If they say spring lizards, it is supposed to be this species of salamander. So this is technically the only species that is legal for uh, folks who fish to use as bait. But you're going to find this guy in streams um, and uh, uh, I don't think you can go back there anymore, but Dripping Springs is a great place to see uh, dusky salamanders, but but typically creeks, small streams, you know, just like Vaughn Creek, uh, so you're going to be able to, to see them there as well. And then our state amphibian, uh, the Tennessee cave salamander is endemic to um, Tennessee and, and Alabama and is a cave obligate. So lives no place else but caves. It's state threatened. Uh, it's currently being uh, studied by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as to whether or not it needs to be federally listed um, as endangered. Uh, again, it's a cave obligate. It too is a neotenic, which means it's never going to lose its gills. It's always going to stay in this juvenile stage, uh, even even to, to breed. Uh, these guys are three to seven and a quarter inches. Um, Living caves occur in Tennessee and Alabama only. They occur no place else uh, in the world, but in our uh, Tennessee and Alabama caves. You look at this name right here, Matthew Niemiller. He's the uh, herpetologist that wrote The Amphibians of Tennessee and The Reptiles of Tennessee, two incredibly good books uh, specifically about our uh, herps in, in Tennessee. Uh, another incredible salamander, this is the red salamander, Pseudotriton ruber. A very large one, you know, girth-wise, uh, lengthwise, it's only six or two and three quarters to six inches. This name means false god, pseudo false triton god, and then the ruber means red. This guy occurs in cold, clear, rocky to sandy streams. Um, I've seen this at Sycamore Creek uh, Girl Scout camp in their little string uh, uh, back there. Uh, it it well, you can find this in streams leading out of caves. Um, so um, it's a super cool salamander. This is a common salamander that you would find uh, in Vaughn Creek. This is the two line salamander. Um, and the, it's in what we call the brook salamanders. Eurycia means the brook salamanders. Cerigera is referring to little projections on the nostrils of the males uh, that they use to again, try to entice the females. Uh, to, to breed. These are relatively small, two and a half to three and a quarter inches. Um, you know, that Eurycia, uh, again, they're the brook salamanders, but it's also uh, due to the mythological creature of um, Ophius and Eurydice. Uh, remember those guys? Eurydice was um, um, in Hades, in Ophius or Orpheus, uh, went down and his only instruction was to not look back. And unfortunately he did, but uh, that's where this uh, genus name comes from. Here's another uh, brook salamander in the genus Eurycia, Longicotta. And so that Longicotta refers to that long tail that you have. And uh, it has these uh, herringbone patterns on that tail. And that's how you know that it's a long tailed uh, salamander. You know, uh, with this guy, the tail is more than 50% of its entire body. But this guy you find in streams, uh, spring runs. Um, uh, again, you can find this in uh, Vaughn's Creek where you would have to look for these guys. Where I find them a lot of times is when you've got that the leaf litter uh, that is kind of bound up in a, in a ball. Sometimes they'll be in, in those balls and that's how you, how you find them on the edges of the, of the streams in that leaf litter. Uh, and this is a salamander that I have found it. Warner Park, one of my favorite ones. This is the slimy salamander, Plethodon glutinosus. And, and uh, many of these salamanders are in the family Plethodonidae. Uh, and these are the lungless salamanders. So all of the Plethodons are lungless, which means they have no lungs. And so they get all of their oxygen through their skin. You know, it's a gaseous exchange through 
through the skin and they have to stay moist, but these guys live in the woods. Uh, these uh, are considered the woodland salamanders. So they don't necessarily come to ponds or live in creeks. Um, and the way that they get around that is they have direct development, which means they have no larval stage, which is kind of interesting. Again, something totally, totally different uh, that you, do, you don't even think about is the direct development of slimy salamanders. Uh, one way that they, they keep themselves um, moist is if they've got a uh, gel, uh, glutinous, as you might imagine, a glue-like substance on their body. If you pick them up, they're very, very sticky. Um, so um, not something you wanna you wanna do. Do I have a question up here in the chat? Oh, <laughs> okay, never mind. All right. So yeah, these guys only breathe through their through their skin. And I'm, oh, there we go. All right. So, um, so that, so we've got a ton of salamanders in the state. I wasn't advancing for some reason. Uh, and now we're going to move on to the frogs and toads. And uh, we have a great diversity of uh, frogs and toads, uh, 22 species, really 21. One is kind of like a, uh, an accidental um, Southern Plains um, uh leopard frog that kind of hopped over the line in, in northwest Tennessee. But uh, for the most part, we have 21 species of frogs and toads in Tennessee. And if you know leaps, you know it's one of our loves is the frogs and toads of the state. I'm going to quickly go through these. I'm going to uh, help you to identify them, um, tell you a little bit about TAMP, and I'm going to um, play their songs for you. Um, now, uh, if, if you get interested in this, I'm not going to show you all 21 species. Uh, you can go to the LEAPS website, www.leaps.ms, like Microsoft.ms, uh, to, to hear these, these frog songs again. But uh, the very first breeder that we have in the state is the upland chorus frog. These guys have already bred. They're already done. Uh, so they, they were breeding back in, in December. Uh, they're small. Um, they often have these three stripes down their back. They're, the fairy arums, these stripes are typically broken. They have a, a dark triangle between their eyes um, a, a lot of the times. Um, again, they're small, three quarters to one and three eighths inches. They breed in December. That, that name, Thudacris, means false cricket because they might sound like a cricket to some folks. Fieriero means lover of the festival. Now, maybe that means uh, because they breed during the Christmas holidays, it's the lover of the festival. Or it may be because they, they sing day and night that it's like they're having a festival. It's, it's hard to tell uh, which is which. But let's play, let me play that for you. And um, it sounds like someone taking their thumbnail and, and rubbing it, uh, dragging it down the teeth of a, of a comb. So now remember amphibians and reptiles are ectothermic and they're the same temperature as the air or water around them. That also affects the speed of things. Now that particular call was on a cold night, so it's kind of slow, um, but they can be, the sound can be faster than that if, it's, if they're warmer. Another relatively early breeder uh, is gonna be breeding in January, February, and sometimes into March is the spring peeper, Sudeikis crucifer. That crucifer refers to this cross on their back. Um, these guys are, are tiny. Uh, they're three quarters of an inch to one and a quarter inch. And now for the frogs, uh, when I'm saying three quarter to one and a quarter, it's snout vent length from the snout to their vent. This is their vent, their cloaca. Um, that's the, the cloaca is the opening that they use to reproduce, the opening that they use to excrete waste. It's, um, you know, it's kind of their um, main orifice. Um, but yeah, so the crucifer is, refers to that cross on the back. These guys, early breeders, they only lay one egg on, on the vegetation. 
in a lot of different places, but it's very hard to find uh, spring peeper eggs. Uh, not hard to hear them at all because they have a loud piercing call uh, that sounds, you know, like the name would would suggest, like a loud peep. The green frog, or yeah, green frog in there, that clunk, we'll hear that a lot. It, they show up on a lot of the recordings. There's a barred owl in there too, if you could hear that. All right, another, uh, this is a really cool frog. It's a gastrophrynae carolinensis, the narrow mouth toad. Um, gastrophrynae literally means stomach toad, and that's just because of this big belly. Uh, so gastro means stomach, phrynae means toad, carolinensis is probably the first uh, place that it um, was described, um, but they're very, very small, seven eighths to one and a quarter inch snout bent length. Um, they have a little fold of skin right here that they can pull over their eyes. These guys eat ants, and so, um, you know, if you if they can enter an ant hill and be able to eat by folding that fold over their eyes. I've never seen that, uh, but I have read about that. Um, these guys like cedar glades or cedar glade like areas, um, very much like the old quarry in Warner Park. And that's one of the very first places that I found uh, narrow mouth toads was, was there at the area we call the old quarry um, along that trail. Um, but having a, a super neat uh, song that they sing. And again, these are the males singing in the chorus, trying to attract the females to come to the breeding pools. Uh, to breed, and people describe this call as a newborn lamb bleating, or or uh, New Year's Eve party horns. Either 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 way, it's a super cool call, and one you can't hardly miss. It's a West Tennessee recording, so there's some southern cricket frogs in there, uh, gray tree frogs, which is statewide, um, but a nice, a nice recording. All right, and then this is a eastern spadefoot toad. Um, just like I, I meant to tell you on the uh, narrow mouth toads, they love heavy rainfall. So, uh, you know, as soon as it warms up, those guys are going to be happy and they're going to be out there uh, singing their song, just like these eastern spadefoots. The spadefoots love torrential downpours and uh, severe weather, so they should be happy uh, this coming weekend as, as well. Uh, these guys are fossorial. They spend most of their time underneath the ground, um, but then when those heavy rains come, uh, they come up. They breed really fast, what's called explosive breeders, uh, and they have a special adaptation in, in that their eggs develop fast and their, their uh, larvae develop fast because they breed in only temporary pools of water that are the result of, of heavy rainfall. Uh, so they, they've got a really interesting life strategy. Um, they're around two inches, uh, again, snout bent. They have vertical pupils. Uh, they're very nocturnal. Uh, scaphiopus means spade foot, and they do have a spade on their back foot uh, that they use to dig backwards uh, into their burrows uh, when they're ready to go back underneath the ground. Um, their call is um, very unique in that it sounds um, like a young crow, or people also say that this sounds like someone getting sick. Um, I'll let you decide. Kind of crazy. 
um, you got American toads calling uh, there. And, and if you see me smiling, it's because all of these pictures, uh, I was not there. A lot of the ones that don't have credits, are, they came from TWA stock photos. The, the ones that are from individuals that I know, uh, their their name is on there. But but all of the recordings are, are Leap's recordings. And, and uh, so uh, I'm, I'm remembering, you know, the, the time and place. Um, so m moving on to toads, um, American toads, Anaxorus americanus. Now, if you're an old herpetologist like myself, you remember the toads being in the genus Bufo. Uh, but, you know, taxonomists have to make a living too. And so they have to change animals' names and plant names on a regular basis. So they've changed the toads to Anaxorus. So we have two species of uh, Anaxorus in the state of Tennessee, um, the American toad and the Fowler's toad. And uh, they're both about the same size, you know, two to three and a half inches, uh, again, snout to vent. Um, but the way that you tell them apart is that American toads have large warts. And so they've got only one or two warts per dark spot. That's because their warts are so large, only one or two can fit in those dark spots. Um, and then this is the cranial crest right here. And this is called the, the paratoid gland. And the paratoid gland on the American toads only touch that uh, cranial crest uh, just via a spur. So there's a little bit of space right there. So they don't touch, they don't bump up against them like um, the Fowler's toad does. But all of these warts in the paratoid glands, these are poison glands. So uh, if an animal were to chomp down on a toad like this, there would be like milky poison. It would enter that animal's mouth and, uh, and you know they would spit them back out and you know if something like a cat or a small dog actually swallowed a toad this size uh, then they could very well die so so they they protect themselves via that memory of that of that poison um, but they've got a beautiful song and that song is a long drawn drawn out melodious trill um, it sounds like it's going to go on um, forever but this is a, a really good sign of spring uh, I um, dug a pond, had a pond dug in, in uh, my field uh, just about a month ago, and I already have about 300 American toad tadpoles in it. So, so these guys, it's, they truly are, if you build it, they will come. So pond, ponds are an incredible way to attract uh, amphibians. This is the American toad song. there's one more uh, and they lay long strings of eggs and so you know if you go to the pond after you've been hearing the American toads call you'll see these long delicate streams they look like they have black pearls uh, in them but um, strings of eggs now this is the Fowler's toad um, and it looks very similar to the American toad about the same size but look how many their warts are smaller so they can have three or more warts uh, in, in these dark spots because they have such smaller warts. Uh, also, their cranial crest is not as big as the American toad cranial crest and the paratoid gland bumps right up against that, that cranial crest. Um, but the main way that you can tell uh, the American toad and the Fowler's toad apart is by their song. And whereas the American toad had this long melodious trill, the Fowler's toad has this bursting cry of a call that people say it sounds like a baby crying or uh, an alarm clock. So here it goes.
All right. And so, uh, and then our smallest frogs in Tennessee are the, the cricket frogs. This is the eastern cricket frog, uh, Acris prepitans. Um, again, they can be like one inch, you know, five eighths to one and three eighths inches. Again, snout to bent length. Um, they can be a number of colors. They, they're typically the same color as whatever habitat they're living in. Uh, so, you know, if it's the fall, sometimes they can be brown and orange. Um, you know, we've seen them black and yellow before. And so um, they can be a variety of colors, but this is pretty typical. They usually have a, a dark triangle in their eye. They often will have a racing stripe down their back. But again, don't, you can't go by color a lot of the time on amphibians. Um, but these guys, they have a, a, a sound, a call. The males have a call that sounds like someone tapping stones together. And in particular, chert stones or marble um, uh, together. Uh, or even glass, so, you know, like the clackers of the of the 70s um, together. And so I'll, I'll let you hear that. Now, the, the Eastern Cricket Frog, their song starts off slowly, ramps up to a fast rate, and then it slows down again. people out there tapping rocks together these guys breed later and so you know but but starting up now april may so when it's gotten a little bit warmer is when you're going to see these um breed now this is a gray tree frog uh, and the tree frogs are in the genus hyla and all tree frogs have these toe pads um they typically will have this uh, white blotch under their eye um and we have two species of a uh, tree frog or gray tree frog in Tennessee, uh, both the Chrysostomus and Versicolor. Now we call them the gray tree frog complex because they both look identical to one another. So you can't tell them apart visually. And the only way that you can tell them apart listening to them is if you were to record them and count the number of pulses uh, per second of their call. And so because it's so difficult to identify them in, in programs like TAMP, the Tennessee Amphibian Monitoring Program that I'm going to tell you about in just a, a bit, um, we just asked for the, the gray tree frog complex. Um, they definitely are two different species. Uh, we know that from their chromosomes. One's uh, diploid, the other's tetraploid. So one's got double the number of chromosomes as the other one does. Um, and that song is um, different enough that they can tell each other apart. So they are different, uh, definitely two different species. Um, but their song is like a buzzy creel. And, and the recording that I'm about to play is a unique recording in that the microphone is on Hala Versicolor, which has the slower of the two calls. And then all of the other frogs in the background are Hyla Chrysoslis, which has a faster, buzzier uh, call. So these are the gray tree frogs. Um, they are will you know are are just now starting to to sing, and uh, they will start coming to the breeding pools very soon. And they lay uh, skims of eggs across the surface uh, of the water. So uh, you'll start seeing those soon on um, on ponds and things of that sort. So if you have a discerning ear, you can tell that the first, the, the one that was closest was a tiny bit slower uh, than the, the ones in the background. Now, uh, people ask a lot of times, you know, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? And the reason I put this here is because some people call gray tree frogs tree toads because they do look a little toad-like. And, and typically, you know, uh, the only true toads in the state are in that genus Anaxorus or the old genus Bufo. Um, so all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Uh, but typically toads have dry, warty skin. Frogs have smooth, moist skin. And toads have short legs and hop. And that's, that's how some get mislabeled. The misnomers get started. You have things like the narrow mouth toad. You have things like the spade foot 
toad. You have things like the tree toad here. If you'll notice, they all have a large belly and they all have to hop because they've got short legs. And so that's how they get the name toad when they're truly not toads. Um, things that are frogs and are known as frogs have long legs and they leap. But again, our true toads are in the genus Anaxorus, um, that O genus uh, Bufo. And then uh, more tree frogs, bird voice tree frog, Hyla Ava Boca, um, one of the most beautiful frogs, is, and one that has one of the most beautiful voices, um, and one that you can hear uh, easier in Middle Tennessee than you used to be able to. Uh, once upon a time, you know, you either had to go to Neptune Slough, uh, which is gated off now, or West Tennessee to hear bird voice tree frogs. But now, uh, if you walk the Bicentennial Trail, in June, May, June, you're going to be able to hear bird voice tree frogs uh, and the green tree frog that I'm going to show you here in, in just a little bit. These guys look very much like the gray tree frogs, um, but if you could see their flash colors right here, they're transparent green on the bird voice tree frog. On the gray tree frog, they're bright orange and, and black, and, and these flash colors confuse predators. When the frog leaps, the, the predator sees those bright colors. Uh, and then when the frog lands and conceals those colors, uh, it gives the predator a false search image. And so they can't see the frog. They just can't, they, their brain won't see it for them. So that helps them to survive. Um, but these guys are one and an eighth to one and three quarters inches. They breed May, June, into, into July. Um, but you can, you can hear these uh, on the Bicentennial Trail in Cheatham County. Um, near that the the reservoir wildlife management area there so but listen to this incredibly beautiful song ava boca means bird voiced And here's that green tree frog. Um, this is a species of frog that once only occurred in West Tennessee. You'd have to go west of the Tennessee River to see it and hear it. Uh, but now it occurs statewide. Um, and, and this is something that TAMP is telling us and people are just reporting in. Uh, but these guys uh, occur all the way uh, to Cades Cove uh, now. So they are, they are statewide. Um, but they are a beautiful frog. They're coastal plain species typically. Um, but, you know, they're a tree frog with this, this, this white stripe going down their side. A beautiful, beautiful frog. And they have a song that sounds like a bicycle horn. Or some folks have said New York traffic. I'll play that for you. <laughs> There you go. All right, and so I want you to notice the texture on the back of this green tree frog. Look how smooth it is. Now, this next species of tree frog, when you look at it, it has a very granular back. But sometimes people confuse uh, these two species. This is a barking tree frog that once upon a time used to be on only three isolated pockets across the state. Um, and now they are mostly a West Tennessee species, uh, but they you know, are very much further north than, than they used to be in West Tennessee. So they're expanding their range as well. So it's wonderful when your citizen science program is giving you good information or positive information about uh, populations of, of um, a faunal group. Uh, these guys are two to two and five eighths inches. Again, that, that back is rougher. Uh, but they have a very different call than the, the green tree frog. Uh, this guy breeds in June. It will not sing if it is below 70 degrees at night or day. So they like for it to warm up. And so they start early, uh, late June or early, early July is when they like to, like to start breeding. 
But this is the call. You got two calls on here. One is the um, breeding song that sounds like a beagle on the trail of a rabbit. It's the name Barking Tree Frog. And then the other is a tr announcement call. And frogs have all different kinds of calls. And the announcement call is, hey, I'm coming down the tree and I'm about to get to the pond. And it sounds like a yappy dog, like yeah, yeah. And so uh, listen for two of those. There's two recordings here. So listen for both of those calls. <laughs> green frogs in the background on on that one and uh that scientific name gradiosa means pleasing for whatever reason all right let's get into the true frogs uh the ranids and, and they're all you know they're all true frogs um, but the the uh, uh the what people are the family ranidae the larger frogs um which are now not ranids anymore they're lithobates is the genus but they're still in the family ranidae and um, folks used to know that genus is, is Rana. Uh, but these are the large frogs. This is the American bullfrog, uh, three and a half to six inches. Uh, the largest one's been eight inches, but remember that's just the snout to the vent. It's not including these big legs uh, right here. Um, but this is the largest frog you're gonna find in Tennessee. Um, you can tell the male from the female by the tympanum. That's the eardrum right here. If it's if the tympanum is larger than the eye, uh, then it's a male. If it's smaller than the eye, it's a female. This is a borderline one, but I'm going to call this one a male. Um, and the thing about bullfrogs is they don't have a dorsal lateral ridge. They have a tympanic ridge. You see this ridge going around the tympanum? They have a tympanic ridge, but they do not have a, a dorsal lateral ridge. And that's how you're going to separate them from green frogs in just a little bit. But most folks are familiar with the jug of rum of the uh, bullfrog. <laughs> there you go, jug of rum. All right, and here's that green frog. Um, and it, it's a little bit smaller than bullfrogs. They only get to the three inches snout to vent. But look at this dorsal lateral ridge going down the back. And this is definitely a male because that, that uh, tympanum is much larger uh, than the eye. Um, but these guys, you've been hearing it on the background of a lot of the recordings, but it sounds like uh, the loose banjo string. Donk, 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 sometimes. And then they've got another call. It's like the cowardly lion. That's, <laughs> and that's when they're trying to get someone to leave their territory. It's amazing the vocabulary that frogs have and, the, and what different calls mean. Um, now, a uh, pickerel frog. This is a super cool frog because it hasn't been known to be in Warner Park for very long. And uh, Kim Bailey is the, the finder of this frog. I think it was in uh, what they call the fishing lake along Highway 100 or in that general vicinity. Uh, but it was a new species when she found it a few years back. Um, I missed it on my inventory when I was there in the park for whatever reason. But um, these guys are beautiful frogs. Uh, palustrous means marsh or swamp. They're one and three quarters to three inches long. And then they've got these uh, squarish dorsal lateral blotches or rectangular blotches going down their back in two rows, very organized. Um, and they've got a sharp snout and they do not have a white spot in their tympanum, which will help you to separate these from leopard frogs. Uh, these are one of the growlers, which means they've got a long drawn out growl of a call. Yeah. 
these guys are super cool in that they like cold water. They like springs, uh, but they also like the mouth of caves. And so when you're in a cave and you're leaving and you hear one of these guys do that growl behind you, <laughs> a little scary, which that has happened. Um, and then this is the southern leopard frog, which looks a little bit like the uh, pickerel frog that we just had. Um, but look, these are spots, not organized rectangles. Uh, and they've got this white spot in their ear. Super jumpers. These guys are super jumpers. And they they often spend a lot of time away from uh, the water. And look at that dorsal lateral ridge going all the way down to the groin uh, area. Um, but again, like the rest of these, th these guys have already bred. They bred back in February. They've got big egg masses uh, that you can find in ponds a lot of the time. Um, but these guys have a call that sounds like you know, there's just a huge party uh, and everybody's laughing. Uh, and then in the midst of it, there'll be like this rub on a balloon, like, ar, ar, ar. So, um, so here you go. Let's hear this one. And this is uh, one of the earliest uh, frogs to, to breed, January or February. Um, this is the wood frog, uh, Lithobates sylvaticus. Uh, it is a frog with the bandit's mask. Um, and this is an interesting frog because it occurs in the mountain and it occurs up north, but it also occurs in Cheatham County. So uh, Cheatham County is an oddity when it comes to amphibians and reptiles. It's a very cool place to study herps. Um, but in these guys, they sound like um, ducks quacking. Sounds like a raft of ducks. Um, but it's at night. And so ducks don't typically quack at night. Uh, so if you hear something that sounds like a raft of ducks in a wetland in January, February, it's a good chance that it's going to be a wood frog. Okay, and so if you're super interested in frogs and toads, uh, one of the ways that you can contribute to science um, is the Tennessee Amphibian Monitoring Program. This program has been going on since 1995 and is giving us some real uh, long-term trends uh, in the frog and toad populations across uh, the state. If you're interested, um, go to www.leaps.ms. Robert English is the coordinator of the TAMP program. Uh, he's working on a, on a online training workshop as, as well as the quiz that you take in order to get yourself ready uh, for getting out there. And uh, I've got to do that tomorrow night. Hopefully it won't be storming to, tomorrow night. But uh, anyway, if you're super interested, join um, the TAMP effort. Now, lizards um, in Tennessee. Now, we don't have near as many lizards in Tennessee, uh, and we don't have near as many pictures because uh, it is hard to get a picture of a lizard. Uh, but we have some very interesting lizards in the state. We have five families and nine species, and I'm going to go over uh, the ones that I've got information on. So um, the eastern fence lizard. So this is one of the, what they call a spiny lizard. You can see those uh, rough uh, spines on it. Um, that is, they're about four to seven inches total length. Now, whenever we say total, that means snout to the tip of the tail. So they're not very big. Um, the males of these guys have a black belly and a bright blue uh, throat. Uh, undulatus means wavy pattern. You can kind of see the wavy pattern here. And um, Mary Dunlap, a famous naturalist in, in Nashville, 
uh, studied the eastern fence line uh, in the Warner Parks when there are a lot more split rail fences there. So split rail fences are a great place to find these guys. But, you know, also is the deck you know, or your back porch because people call this, you know, what's this little lizard? It looks like a dinosaur. And it's a, a eastern fence lizard, uh, one of the spiny lizards. Now, one of our more common uh, lizards are the skink. And these are the ones that are shiny. Uh, they've got shiny scales, but they, they still have scales uh, on their back. And we've got three different species of skinks uh, in Tennessee. We've got five-line skink, southeastern five-line skink, and the broad-headed uh, skink. Now, you know, um, when we're talking to especially kids or the general public, we don't, we don't try to get them to separate these two much because you have to catch them to be able to make some of these uh, distinct, you know, uh, being able to identify the different species. You have to be able to count these scales above the lip. <laughs> these are called labial scales. Uh, but this guy right here is a broad-headed skink. And so if you were to catch this broad-headed skink, you would see that it has five labial scales on, above its lip. And then it has on the subcaudal scales underneath the tail here, it has a broad row of, of scales right there. Um, this is a little picture uh, out of the Peterson Field Guide, and it is perfect to help you uh, discern one skink uh, from another as far as the five line, the broad headed, uh, in the southeastern five line. You know, and I said three, that's that's just the three that are kind of confusing. We all ho also have coal skinks and ground skinks. So we've got more species than just those three, but these are the three that you're that are common, especially in Nashville, um, that you're gonna see. And then if you're going out to get them down to species, you're gonna have to look at those different scales uh, to be able to do that. But skinks are very cool in that, um, you know, a lot of people think, reptiles you know lay their eggs and leave but that's not necessarily so uh, this is a broad-headed skink uh, female staying in her nest with her eggs um, and she is guarding those eggs and uh, you can see here this is July 11th here uh, on this um, and then come July 17th that the eggs have hatched and you know young skinks have this bright blue uh, tail uh, in the in their uh, stripes are much more vivid than they are when when they're adults. So you know, so a lot of reptiles uh, do t uh, take care of their young. You know, alligators do. You know, skinks do. So, um, so some of those are are misnomers. You know, thing about lizards that's super cool is that they can drop their tail, and that's a protective measure. If a predator was after them, they've got a special link in their vertebrae, their tail vertebrae. They can they can just drop their tail, and then they leave a, a wiggling tail there, and the predator goes for the tail versus the, the animal. And the animal uh, survives. It can't grow that tail back perfectly, um, but they can grow that tail back. Salamanders, on the other hand, they can regenerate parts good as new. So uh, if you know humans could could learn their secret to that, then, then we would uh, be in business. Here's a lizard that uh, in Tennessee that most folks aren't familiar with, and that's the anole. You know, uh, this group, this guy's in the same family as the chameleons. It can change their color, and this guy can change its color, but only it only has two, green or brown. But uh, but they can still change their color, um, and they are five to nine inches in length. The male has a pink uh, dewlap. And they're considered a species of greatest conservation uh, need just because we don't know much about them. We've got huge data gaps. I mean, I've seen them in Hickman County, and then I've seen them at the walls of Jericho, um, at Bear Hollow Mountain Wildlife Management Area, but that's the only two places I have seen it. So uh, we, we just need more information about um, anoles. I told you lizards would go fast. Turtles would go fast, too. Um, but um, in Tennessee, we've got four families of turtles. We've got 15 species of turtles. Um, but uh, while I'm on the slide, I want to tell you, I'm taking a class called the uh, Master Herpetologist class. Um, and I never knew how fascinating turtles um, are until that, that class, in particular, the, the turtles like this, the, the painted turtle. Um, but, you know, box turtles are one of the most common turtles you're going to find in Tennessee. Um, they are four and a half to six inches. And then when we're talking about turtles, as far as how they're measured, uh, it's their it's the carapace of their shell. So the, the top of their shell is called the carapace. The bottom is called the plastron. 
and you'd have to take a pair of calipers. You know, you're not going over the curve. You're going straight up, you know, on the distance here. So a pair of calipers to get the front of the, the, the shell to the back of the shell. And box turtles are basically six inches um, when they're full grown. Um, but, you know, turtles are long lived, especially box turtles are long lived. They don't mature until they're at least 10 years old. Um, and they can get, you know, um, very old. Box turtles can live over 100 years. Um, and, you know, cool thing about box turtles, you can tell their sex just by looking at their eyes. The males have uh, red or orange eyes and the females have yellow or brown eyes. And then, you know, kids love this. You can count the number of rings on their, on the, the scoot on their shell and tell at least how old they are. It's very, very cool. These guys are uh, listed as a species of greatest conservation need due to the illegal har harvest for the black market. So because these guys are so long lived, they're given as heirlooms from, from one family member uh, to another, uh, in particular in uh, Asian countries. So there is a black market for box turtles, and, and that is one reason we stay on the alert as to how they're doing. The alligator snapping turtle. Um, you know, this is our largest uh, turtle in the country. <laughs> That's, you know, that in, you know, not their sea turtles, but uh, as far as our inland turtles, this is a, a very large turtle. Again, they're at the carapace of their shell can get up to 26 inches. They can get to 126 pounds. They're huge. They've got this hook beak. They've got that pink lure uh, to invite fish or whatever into their mouth and whatever goes in there, they eat. Uh, they've got three ridges going down their, their back, uh, but look at this, they've got a smooth tail, something to keep in mind if you're trying to tell them from a common snapping turtle. And if you think the alligator snapping turtle is just a West Tennessee species, well, I have seen one at Radnor Lake. So uh, there has been an alligator snapping turtle uh, below the spillway at, at Radnor Lake. So they do, they do come into uh, Middle Tennessee. Uh, there's a Head Start program with TWA and the Nashville Zoo where they grow alligator snapping turtles to a size that uh, predators can't just gobble them up immediately uh, and then release them. And then when they do, they put these transmitters on them uh, and track them via telemetry to see to see how they're doing. And then a common snapping turtle is what most people uh, see and they get big, they get up to 35 pounds. Um, on average, in the 75 up to 75 pounds, and, and that carapace can be uh, 14 inches. So, um, you know, so they can get big, and people think these are alligator snapping turtles. But you know what? They lose the, the, the ridges on their back, but they keep the ridges on their tail. So they do have a, a nice ridges on their tail that you can help separate you or separate uh, them from the alligator uh, snapping turtles. These are beautiful turtles. But look at that little bitty plastron that they have. They have to really protect themselves. Um, you know, and, and uh, gosh, one of the things uh, that affects snapping turtles is people still eat them to some extent. So not a good idea. Um, these guys are long lived and, you know, they have a lot of fat in these tissues, but they also bioaccumulate a lot of toxins, heavy metals. Uh, so it is not a good idea to eat. Um, you know, alligator snapping turtles. It's also not a good idea to eat box turtles because they can eat poisonous mushrooms that will kill us. So I want to leave those guys alone too. So don't eat turtles. So uh, one of our, my favorite turtles is the Eastern Spiny Soft Shell. And these are the turtles that have the leathery shell. They're riverine turtles, which means they live in, in rivers, but they can be small rivers like the little harpeth. And we've seen uh, soft shell turtles and the little harpers before. Um, they do nest on sandbars. Um, this leathery shell versus that heavy shell makes them a fast swimmer. It gives them speed so it's not as heavy as the, heavy, as the bigger, the, the solid shell. Um, but these guys, they can really give you the, you know, they've got a beak like all turtles and they've got a long neck and they can really give you a nasty bite um, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not careful when you catch them. It's called spiny because of these spines right here uh, behind their neck. And then there's a smooth soft shell in West Tennessee that does not have these little spines right there. This is a beautiful turtle, the uh, southern painted turtle. We know it's a southern painted turtle because of this incredibly delicate red line going down its back. 
Um, these guys are mostly a West Tennessee turtle, uh, but I wanted to put it in here because I'm learning that they are one of the most incredibly cold tolerant uh, reptiles there are. I mean, these guys can, can uh, create any freeze in their body to help them deal with sub-freezing temperatures up, up north. So these guys can survive the northern uh, cold temperatures, um, which, you know, amphibians and reptiles have, have many, many uh, adaptations to help them survive as far as temperature goes. All right, so I'm going to rip through these snakes and then I'll open it up for questions for those that are left. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Uh, I'll get through the snakes in about 10 minutes. And so uh, it'll be like one or uh, 20 after when I'm when I'm completely done. Um, but Tennessee only has two families of snakes. We have 32 species. Only four of those are uh, venomous. So, um, you know, most of the time when you see a snake, it's not venomous. Um, but I'm going to tell you how to tell the difference between the two. Uh, Jacay's brown snake uh, is a snake that is nine to 13 inches. It eats slugs and worms. Look at this. Look at this. Viviparous. That means they give live birth. The cool thing about snakes is they can be oviparous, which means they can lay eggs. They can be ovoviviparous, which means they lay eggs in their body and then their eggs hatch and they have life birth. But then they can be like this uh, decays brown snake and they can be viviparous, which means they give live birth, which there are no eggs ever and there's a placenta. So, um, you know, nothing is simple about amphibians and reptiles, but they are, are incredibly fascinating. So this is one of our most evolutionary advanced snakes. And then this is a, a cool snake, uh, the queen snake, Regina septembatata. Uh, one of the most beautiful scientific names uh, is Regina, which is, uh, means queen. And septembatata means seven stripes because of these stripes that it has. I always want to call queen snakes her, but they're, they're not even, uh, not all of them, uh, but uh, have these stripes uh, going across their back. Um, and these guys, they eat newly shed crayfish which means you know the soft shelled crayfish which they you can if you go snorkeling in places like uh, Big Swan Creek you can see these guys in the water hunting in the crevices of the rocks for those newly shed crayfish um super duper super 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 but these guys are, are relatively common or at least they were uh in the Little Harpeth River so you can see these in the Little Harpeth they like to hang out on the branches above uh rivers like the Little Harpeth River and here's one of the coolest snakes ever. This is the uh, Eastern hognose snake, Heterodon platyrrhinus. Platyrrhinus means flat nose. Heterodon means different teeth. And hognose do have different teeth. They are, they are rear fanged. So they do have venom in these teeth that are in the back of their head. And they're called uh, hognose because they've got this turned up nose that looks like a snout uh, of a hog. Uh, but these are what people, old timers call puff adders because they really will hiss at you. They'll, they'll flatten their head out like an asp and then they'll hiss at you. Um, and this is a snake that if, if you uh, mess with after it goes through hissing at you and spreading its head, it will flip over and play dead. And it, it'll lull its tongue out and, and, and play dead. Uh, and if you try to turn it over, it'll flip right back over. Um, but these guys have those rear fangs because they eat toads. And the first thing a toad does when uh, it's captured is it blows up. It tries to make itself bigger than it really is. And then those rear fangs do two things. Um, they anesthetize the toad and they puncture the toad to where it can no longer inflate itself. Um, so hognose have got all kinds of crazy adaptations um, that, are, that are, make them really interesting. And then the Eastern king snake, uh, Lampropeltus jetula, shiny uh, shield uh, is what their scientific name means. And they have smooth scales. Now, when you get into herpetology, one of the things that you're going to use to help you identify snakes is whether or not it has smooth scales or keeled scales, or it has a line down every the center of every scale. King snakes have smooth scales. See how smooth it looks? And even if you don't like snakes, you should like king snakes because they eat other snakes, uh, even venomous snakes. They are immune to the venom of venomous snakes. And so they are a great snake to have around. They get up to 48 inches, so four feet in length. They eat other snakes, but they also eat rats and mice. But they are a beautiful snake, closely related to the eastern uh, milk snake, 
which also has smooth scales. Um, and this is a snake uh, that often occurs in barns and people thought that they milk their cows, but actually what they're doing is they're there to eat the rats and mice that eat the uh, grain spillage uh, in the barns. Uh, these guys have blotches that have black borders to those blotches. Um, somebody might think this looks like a uh, copperhead, but it but it doesn't. These blotches you know, are, are entire and they've got those black lines ar around them. And then this is the, uh, one of the other coolest scientific uh, names is this Ophiodrus estivus uh, for the group, the rough green snake. This is a, a snake that lives in vines and small trees, gets, you know, 32 inches. But that scientific name, it only eats insects. The scientific name is Ophio means snake, Dris means tree, estivus means summer, summer tree snake. So uh, again, a beautiful scientific name. This is a northern black racer. This is a snake that has the myth of chasing people, and they are territorial. One ran my mom out of the hay loft one time and made her break her tailbone uh, in the barn, uh, but it was just defending its nest and its territory. So they don't really chase you, but they don't, they do stand their ground. Um, they can get up to be 60 inches, uh, five feet long. They have smooth scales. Sometimes they look like a rubber snake, and then they've got this white patch under their eyes. Now, this is the call that I get every spring. What is this snake? You know, what is this baby snake? And you would never believe that this is a baby black racer. Baby black racers look nothing like their parents. Um, and they look totally different. You can look by the scales on the, on the head, but it's best just to know this pattern because babies look nothing like their, their parents. And this is a rat snake, probably the most common. Uh, snake that that we get calls about or and people see uh, in Tennessee. Oh, look at this. They can get up to 72 inches long. So this is a long snake. They, see, they've got keeled scales. You can see that keel in each scale and that's going to help you identify this as a, a rat snake. These guys are the best climbers. You know, if I get a call that there's a snake climbing up the pole of my deck and now he's onto the roof and now he's going down the chimney, well, then I know it's a great rat snake because they are the best climbers there, there are. They eat rats, uh, but they also eat birds and bird eggs. And so some birders don't like them um, very much, but but I do because they eat lots of rats and, and mice and they're just a super cool snake. Now, look at this scientific name right here, Pantherophis phylloides. And then you look at this scientific name. Don't look at the snake yet, Pantherophis phylloides. But then when you look at the snake, my goodness, it didn't look anything like that. That's why a lot of times you can't go by pattern um, and color 100% uh, of the time on snakes. This too, too is a uh, rat snake and they can be very gray or they can be orange, they can be brown, or they can be very dark uh, like the other. All right, so let's get to our venomous snakes in, in the state. This is a, a part of a program that Lisa Powers from Froghaven Farm and I put together um, back when I worked for TWRA. Um, and I'm going to quickly go through these four venomous snakes in the state. Uh, again, remember, we've got 32 different species, 29 are non-venomous, only four are venomous. And also notice that I'm using the word venomous and not poison. Uh, venomous means that, that um, you know, they are injecting something in you. A poison is something you eat. So the way you remember it, if it bites you and you die, it was venomous. If you bite it and it dies, it was poisonous. So, um these guys are, are venomous. All of our venomous snakes in Tennessee are pit vipers, which means they have this special pit organ to help them detect prey. It's a, it detects heat. They're nocturnal. They hunt at night. And so they can sense heat with this pit uh, on their nose. This is their nostril. This is their pit. And that is their, their, their eye. Um, and this is just a, a, a close up look at that pit and also most of them have vertical pupils now what I'm telling you holds true in Tennessee now if you go down to Florida or you go to Central and South America or if you go to India you're in really big trouble but this holds true in Tennessee as far as these vertical pupils you know somebody's going to say but you know um, there are venomous snakes in other parts of the world that have round pupils that's very true but in Tennessee all of our venomous snakes have vertical uh, pupils um, and then um, all of our snakes in Tennessee are ovoviviparous, which means they lay their eggs in their body, but then the young are born alive. 
So when I get the question, I found some snakes in my backyard. Are you know? Can you tell me whether or not they are venomous or not? And I can say absolutely, they are not venomous snakes in Tennessee. Or uh, you know, they're not the eggs of venomous snakes in Tennessee because the venomous snakes in Tennessee only give live birth. They are ovoviviparous. Ovoviviparous. You know, they have eggs in their body, but the eggs hatch in their body, and the babies are born alive. These are copperheads, and when copperheads are babies, they've got this bright yellow tail to help them attract prey. Again, this holds true in Tennessee. Uh, most of our, uh, or our venomous snakes in Tennessee have a wide triangular head, a narrow neck, um, and uh, that's because their poison glands are right here. This is a, this is a copperhead right, right here, and I'll show you since this is such a good picture. Copperheads have what they, is, I call an hourglass pattern on their body, broad on the side, narrow across the back and broad on the other side. Um, you know, with that triangular head, please remember what I said about the hog nose, they can flatten their head and then water snakes will do it as well, as well as rat snakes. A lot of non-venomous snakes will try to appear like they are more dangerous than they really are by hissing and by flattening their head. And a lot of rat snakes will even sh shake their tail. They can't rattle their tail because they don't have a rattle, but they will shake their tail to try to make you think that they're a rattlesnake. Now, here's a cool thing. Uh, Subcaudal scales underneath the tail of a venomous snake have a single row of scales on the underside. And you're gonna say, you are absolutely out of your mind. I am not gonna catch a snake and turn it over to look at it. You can tell this on the skin, on the shed skin. Um, uh, so folks will call me, I found this shed skin in my garage. If I send it to you, will you tell me whether or not it was venomous from a venomous snake? And I can say yes, because in Tennessee, a venomous snake has these you know, solid, only one uh, row of scales on, on the subcaudal scales. Uh, there you go, just one. Whereas a non-venomous snake has two rows of scales right here. See how that's two right there? And a venomous snake has, has that one row of scales underneath the tail. And this is what it looks like. This is a venomous snake. See, it only has one row of scales there on the subcaudal scales. Here's a, a non-venomous snake, two rows of scale going down subcaudally. And then our snakes uh, have fangs. You know, our venomous snakes have fangs. The non-venomous snake just have teeth. They just have recurved teeth for holding their food in, in place. If you get bitten by one of these guys, it just feels like you stuck your hand in a briar patch. If you get bitten by one of these guys, um, it's different. Um, and, and these are those fangs. Um, so our venomous snakes are copperhead, cottonmouth, pigmy rattlesnake, and pygmy rattlesnake. This is that copperhead. You got a copperhead. Uh, vertical pupil and then they've got these beautiful markings on their back to me it looks like an hourglass wide on the side narrow across the back and wide on the other side then we've got the cotton mouth that only come as far east as Cheatham County so you know we don't have necessarily have to worry about them in most of middle Tennessee but if you go down to Cheatham County uh, you do need to, to look out for them they're in the same genus uh, as uh, copperheads and they have that bright yellow tail when they're babies a cypress means that they eat fish. They've got that broad head, vertical pupils. They have this dark line through their eye. Uh, and they always look like a flat tire. They're a big, flat, chunky uh, snake. Look at that range. Only pretty much West Tennessee, uh, but they can get as far east as Cheatham County. And then this is their gaping behavior. If you're walking the swamps in real foot, you're going to be passing by cotton mouths that are gaping at you, uh, that are that are doing nothing but saying, you know, um, back off. So uh, that is a, a characteristic of the behavior of the cotton mouth. And then we've got the beautiful timber rattlesnake, which is one of my favorite snakes um, in the state. And of course, they have rattles and they occur statewide. And then we've got the little pygmy rattlesnake that a lot of folks aren't familiar with. The tiny little snake doesn't ever get over 20 inches long, brightly colored. It only occurs on the east, on the western Highland Rim, uh, but folks are studying it. So if you're out there and you get bitten by a snake, it happens fast as lightning sometimes, you're going to look down. And if it was a venomous snake, you're going to see two holes that are bleeding. Uh, and that's from the fangs. If, if it was a non-venomous snake, you're going to look down, you're going to see like a U pattern. And all of these are from little bitty teeth. Um, uh, over here, non-venomous, wash your hand and go on. Uh, over here, um, they are saying now that no matter what 
kind of venomous snake it was, you need to get to a hospital. You need to get your keys, get in your car, and get to the hospital. Um, in Tennessee, very seldom does anyone ever die from a snake bite. Uh, but as they say, uh, time is tissue as far as being bitten by a rattlesnake or copperheads. Now, uh, once upon a time, if a copperhead bit you, they would say, take a Benadryl and go home. First of all, don't take a Benadryl. It does nothing for the inflammation process of a venomous snake bite. Uh, and two, just to be on the safe side, so you don't lose any tissue, uh, you should go uh, to the doctor. Preferably, if you're in Middle Tennessee, go to Vanderbilt. They've got anti-venom. They know how to use it. So try to get to Vanderbilt if you can. Um, and uh, don't panic because very, very, very few people ever die from snake bites in this country, period, uh, much less uh, in Tennessee. But, uh, and the, uh, the other thing is don't try to kill the snake to see what it was because the anti-venom uh, works for both uh, or all of our venomous snakes in, in uh, Tennessee. So you don't have to worry about which species, just that you were bitten by a venomous snake. So uh, the calls that you heard were from Leaps. The stock photos that didn't have a name were from TWRA. Other credits were given per photo. And uh, this is my contact information. Um, now, pandyuptrick at gmail.com. If you need to ask me a question or give me, give me a call. Um, and I now have a little business called Tennessee Healthy Habitats, helping people know what's on their land and how to, how to manage their land uh, to create healthy habitats for, for native wildlife. And with that, I'll take any questions that anybody has. I know everybody's probably got to leave um, before the storms roll in, but I will be happy to answer any questions if, for those folks that are still with us. Pandy, can you see the questions that have come through? There's been two that it came through while you were speaking. On the chat, let me go up uh -huh. here and see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's two in the Q&A. Actually, they look like they're repetitive. Okay. And if see. you can't find them, I can read them for you. Do tree frogs need water to survive in adulthood? Um, so it, I don't know if they're referring to drinking they don't drink water they they absorb water um but they you know they need to stay moist they can't desiccate they can't dry out uh but they don't need to, to go back and forth down to the water to get a to get a drink they don't need to do that they just need to stay moist so they're going to be absorbing water uh, you know through through their skin so they don't need to to get a drink but uh, they do need water and they do need to stay moist. And that says, can you speak more about neotenic amphibians? It seems like an interesting evolutionary outcome. Um, yeah, these are, these are uh, salamanders like the cave salamanders and like the, the mud puppies. Uh, even uh, there's a mole uh, salamander, which is actually, the, it's, the, it's a mole salamander that's name is the mole salamander, Talpodium. Um, that also just remains, um, you know, uh, in the larval stage. They they keep their gills, um, but they just go ahead and and develop the ability to reproduce. Um, you know, e even though they're still in a in a larval stage, and and that's to avoid having to leave where they are. So you know, if, they, if they're in a great pond, they can stay in that pond and breed. If they're in a cave, such as the cave salamanders. You know the true cave salamanders. Um, you know they don't want to leave that cave, so they're going. To, that allows them to stay where they are. Yeah, and that is an interesting evolutionary, um, you know, benefit. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, and that's from you. Okay. Do red salamanders migrate far? I have seen them many times during the year on a hill under a log, but we do have small creeks on either side of our hill. So um, the, red, the red salamanders that I am familiar with um, breed, actually there's one uh, group that I'm, population that I'm familiar with that, that breeds in one of TWRA's caves um, in um, on the Eastern Highland Rim and they stay in that cave. So they don't migrate very far. The other one that I saw in Ashland City at Sycamore uh, Creek um, Girl Scout Camp, they were already in a cool stream. But, you know, it's 
the thing about um, amphibians is that they're very opportunistic in that they do what they need to do in order to survive. You know, and some of these we don't even know the answer to. For example, the streamside salamander, you know, they come to the stream, they breed, they lay eggs under rock, uh, and then they leave the stream. But we don't necessarily know how far they go when they leave the stream or if it's a, a different distance, depending on the habitat. You know, in a cedar glade, they're not going to stay out there on the rock. So they're going to have to go further. But in the in place where there's woods, they're just going to have they're just going to go as far as they need to. So um, that's that's the cool thing about amphibians is that they are very adaptable, um, and they um, they kind of do what they've got to do in order to survive and, and and do it differently if they need to. They're they're just they're plastic. In this master herpetology class I'm taking, it that's that's how they describe them is that. Amphibians are plastic in that they can change even their life history, um, you know, um, to, to, to survive. Okay, are, were there any others? Um, do you see the q and It's, I don't oh, know. Let's see, the three Q&A. Can you yeah. speak? Do neotonics also live in water their whole lives? Um, they do. The, yeah, so neotenic. Uh, so, so it's pouring down rain where I. <laughs> yeah, if we the, lose you. Sure. <laughs> Is the, the rain moving in? But um, yeah, so yeah, the, if they're neotenic, they, they stay in the water. So they're going to keep their gill. Uh, yeah, like that mole salamander, the talpodium, they stay in that pond their entire life. Uh, the cave salamander, they stay in that cave stream their entire life. Uh, mud puppies, yes, yeah, have to have permanent bodies of water, so they do live uh, in that in water their entire life. And then uh, water, some of the biggest problems amphibians in Tennessee are facing. Um, I would say in, in Tennessee, it's those individuals that do have a unique habitat, say, for example, the cave salamanders. So, you know, we've, we've got like nine really good populations of cave salamanders. That, that Matt Miller is the champion of Tennessee cave salamanders. Um, but we, you know, the thing about first topography, which the caves are in, you know, uh, that forest limestone, a lot of stuff can enter those caves and, and not all of those caves are on protected lands. And so, we really have to work with the, the private landowners to, to help um, protect those those cave salamanders. And you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be loss of habitat, uh, you know, for the most part. But but now um, we're also dealing with disease. And you know, you've probably heard of ranavirus, and you've probably heard of the chytrid fungus. Those are two diseases that um, that in in some places like Costa Rica you know, or other Central American areas have just wiped out populations of, of frogs. Um, that has not happened in Tennessee, but we do have chytrid fungus in Tennessee and we do have ranavirus in, in Tennessee. And then there's another virus that we have got to be ever vigilant to keep out of this country and that is bee sal. That is called the, the salamander um, uh, chytrid fungus, specifically to um, salamanders. Uh, and it is wreaking havoc in Europe and it comes in on the pet trade. It comes in on the far bellied um, newts and things like that. And, and what's horrible is it it, it really does affect newts uh, the, the worst. And they're one of our most common uh, salamander species, which means if it ever got into our native habitat and our native population, it would run through like wildfire or fire. Um, so the pet trade, um, we've really got to keep educating people, especially on that don't turn it loose thing. I mean, if you get a pet amphibian or reptile, it is yours for life, or you've got to, to make sure that, that you uh, find a home for it. You cannot let pet amphibian and reptiles go. That's, that's a huge educational thing that we need to do, because if you let things like that go that have been in captivity, then they can spread disease and, and literally wipe out populations. 
uh, of native. I mean, can you imagine if Esau got in the Great Smoky Mountain, the birthplace of Plethodonid Salamir? I mean, it would be it would be catastrophic. It would be catastrophic. So, so to me, that's our disease. Um, habitat loss for sure for certain populations, but then disease for overarching issues with the amphibians. Do any Tennessee frog or toads change um, their sex under certain environmental pressures? Hmm. Um, I don't know about frogs or toads. You know, um, with reptiles, turtles um, in particular, uh, the, their sex is determined by temperature. And so if it's, if it's way hot, they're males. If, they're, if it's cooler, they're females. Um, so, you know, that could, if, you know, climate change made everything hot, we were going to have a bunch of males and, and, and no females. And, and then there, now when you look at, you know, it's, it's a lot of different varieties of that. So, so reptiles in particular, especially turtles, are, are, their sex is um, temperature dependent. Um, but I don't no, on that. That's a good question, Paul. Something to look up. I don't know. It would be interesting. Be interesting. So, you know, um, in certain, um, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. I'm going back to my, I'm going back to my class, Paul. I'm, I've just learned this. So it's, it's not, it's not right on the tip of my tongue. Um, yes. So, yes. So look up kleptogenics and Actually, there are certain uh, salamander, you said frogs and toads, though. Certain, there are certain salamander species that actually rob other species for metaphors. Now, listen to this. They, they, you know, they're, they're all in the pond breeding. And then, so now there are certain species in particular, like the stream sides in uh, Kentucky. <laughs> now, we could make Kentucky jokes, but we're not going to. But, the, but in Kentucky, uh, in particular, it, kleptogenics is where klepto means steel. The female salamanders will steal the spermatophores of other species. Um, and then when they have eggs, they're all female. They're a parthogenic um, population of all females. But I'm not, I don't know about frogs and toads. So I know turtles and I know salamanders, but I'm not sure about frogs and toads. But that's a really good question to, to look up. Wow, Pandy, this was so interesting. I learned so much tonight and I can't wait to watch it again. I need to watch it several more times to get all of this um, because I am helping with TAMPS and I was just frog logging last night and um, hey. have some work to send in to you. But um, anyway, this was amazing. Um, before we leave, and I hear the storm is really getting strong right now, just to everyone who's still on and almost everyone is still on, um, next Tuesday, we have a BATS program. It's not a webinar. It's, it's actually a workshop. So it's going to be at Warner Park, Sarah Samaray. I call her the bat woman. Um, she's coming to teach about bats in Middle Tennessee. And then in May, on May the 3rd, we've got um, <laughs> Native Bees of Tennessee by Rita Venable. She wrote the book that a lot of you probably have on your shelves about um, butterflies. So um, you know, sign up for those too. You can go on ahead and sign up for that. But Pandy, this was amazing. And thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. Yeah, yeah try to make, try to make both of those. Um, Sarah st actually studied vampire bats. So um, she's a pretty cool bat person. And, and then she, of course, we all know, we all know, no, we all know Rita Super. So those are great. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, one of my heroes. And so um, it was really nice to be on this with you tonight. And um, thank you for your time and your knowledge and your presentation. And I'm going to go on ahead and stop the recording. And when we do get this wrapped up, uh, Rachel Anderson, the other Rachel at Warner Park, she's the one that's going to go through and, and um, cut out anything that needs to be cut out at the beginning or the end or whatever. And then she'll let me know it's on YouTube. And then I will email everybody. But you guys, you can always go to the YouTube channel for Warner Park Nature Center and see everything we've ever put on there. So there's a lot of interesting things out there. So, um, okay, good night. Thanks again and stay safe in these storms. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.